Okay, the topic is uh, sin. How many of you here are sinners? Raise your hands. Okay. Sino hindi sinner? Meron ba? Okay. So, I, I, just, I was asking uh, Pastor Iko, eh, why, why was this uh, topic assigned to me? Is there any, any particular reason? Uh, because of my behavior or character. <laughs> anyway, so, doctrine of sin. Medyo mabigat. I'm not really a theologian, eh, but I'm not really uh, used to talking about uh, doctrines. But for tonight, uh, we're talking about the doctrine of sin. And under this uh, topic, we will be discussing, ano ba talaga itong sin? Okay, how, would, how do we define sin? And then we will also discuss Saan galing itong sin? Okay? Where did this come from? And then, after that, we will also be tackling ano ba yung nature ng sin ni Adam? Kasi laging, uh, laging siyang tinuturo na may kasalanan dito. You know? What was the nature of Adam's sin? And how does that sin affect all of us? And we shall also discuss what, uh, on the other side, what does the sacrifice of Jesus, or how does the, the sacrifice of Jesus justify us? So as uh, the sin of Adam affected us, now how does the sacrifice of Jesus justify us? And then, what is God's way for us to counteract sin? Okay, and I think uh, that's the most important thing here. We're not here just to talk about, to learn about sin, to be experts in sin, or to uh, be able to discuss sin, but we are here to know how do we counteract or how do we deal with this problem which is called sin. So, first, uh, let's uh, discuss the definition of sin. What is sin? So we have here the target, uh, you know, the usual presentation of a target. Uh, missing the mark, diba? Sabi na, sin is actually missing the mark. You have a mark there, and if you miss that target, that bullseye, you're actually missing the mark. And so is the definition of sin. Sin is actually any failure to conform to the moral standards of God. So merong may, target or merong uh, bullseye si God. And whenever we miss that target, we do not conform to that standard or to that target in terms of action, in terms of attitude or nature, we sin. Okay, so let's uh, himay himay, okay? Let's discuss each of, each of this. We all know, okay, we're very familiar that our actions can, or usually, or as uh, sinners, we fail to conform to the standards of God. And we all know uh, stealing is a sin, okay? The action of stealing is a sin. The action of uh, killing a person or murdering is a sin. Okay, wala nang uh, siguro mag uh, dispute niyan. And also, the action of uh, lying is a sin. So these are just a few examples of sinful actions. But there's also such a thing as sinful attitudes. Our attitudes, uh, we sin by failing to conform to the moral standards of God in terms of our attitudes. Like, ano uh, ba attitudes? Uh, in the Ten Commandments itself, we see a command which says, do not desire, do not covet another man's house. Do not covet his wife, his slaves, his cattle, his donkeys, or anything else that he owns. So co covet covetousness it's a sin. In fact, uh, in the New Testament, covetousness is, uh, um, equi is, uh, equal, or, or is likened to uh, idolatry. Diba? Covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, so covetousness is a desire or an attitude that is sinful. And we break the moral standards of God. Uh, another one is, uh, you find this in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount. Sabi ni Jesus, but I tell you that anyone who is angry 
with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So it's, uh, you don't need to actually physically murder or stab or shoot a person to kill or to commit murder. By the mere act of being angry with your brother or sister, you are already committing murder and you, are, you will be subject to judgment. Okay, another, another example of uh, an attitude is uh, looking lustfully at a woman. And uh, uh, when you do this, sabi ni Jesus, you, he has, who has done this or anyone who has done this has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So how rampant is this sin? Uh, especially right now that uh, the figures or the stats about people involved in pornography or watching pornography is, uh, you know, sky, skyrocketing. Diba? Yung mga, yung mga stats on, uh, these are the most frequently visited websites uh, those which deal with, uh, th- those which, which offer pornographic videos and materials. Uh, so, what else? In uh, the, the, the Epistle of Paul, sa Galatians 5.19, we see here a list of the acts of the flesh, or the acts of the sinful nature. Okay? And sabi rito, sexual immorality, Impurity, which is actually the Greek word, uh, which porneia, meaning uh, pornography, fornication, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, uh, when I was starting here in CCF, uh, I didn't re- realize that I didn't have a very healthy attitude towards leaders. I felt that, you know, coming in here to CCF, I was, uh, in terms, I had the advantage of being a semin- seminary graduate when we all know that most uh, CCF Pastors are only seminar graduates, not seminary graduates. Well, actually, we joke about it. Okay? Mga seminar graduates lang hindi seminary. But when I came here, I came in as, here as, an, as a seminary graduate, and um, I was kind of critical. Okay? I was critical, actually, not only critical. I was questioning uh, decisions, and whenever you hear Pastor Peter say, uh, you know, people who are fond of meeting after the meeting, you know, we have our usual uh, pastors meeting every week. And uh, in the beginning, I was, I I always kept quiet. I don't, you know, usually uh, participate in the discussion. But after the meeting, pag tapos na, pag lubabas na yung mga pastor, that's when I actually make my comments, which are, which are usually, uh, critical of some of the decisions of Pastor Peter and so on and so forth. And so, you know, eventually, you know, after, after uh, having that kind of an attitude, I was uh, rebuked by Pastor Peter. He confronted me. And then during that time, uh, we were, the pastors were given a copy of uh, this book called uh, Undercover by John Be- Be- Bevere. And in that book, I learned about the sin of Saul, okay? Because Saul, uh, you know King Saul, di ba? Sino yung disciple ni King Saul? Who was the disciple of King Saul? Samuel, the prophet Samuel. And uh, Samuel actually gave instructions to King Saul about, you know, uh, you know, you attack, but make sure that you kill everyone. Everything, even the cattle, the, the poor, the rich, the weak, uh, the male, female, the young, old, you kill everything. But in spite of that very clear instruction from King Saul, uh, or from Samuel, King Saul did not disobey. And in fact, uh, when uh, after the, the, that battle, 
uh, King, King uh, Samuel came and confronted King Saul because he heard cattle mooing, and he, he said, oh, "What?" I told you, I gave you a very clear instruction to kill everything, even the cattle. But King Saul said, Sayang kasi. Ang tataba ng mga cattle doon. So we, we brought them home so that we can offer them at the altar of God. And uh, you know what? What really impacted me in that story was what prop, the prophet Samuel told uh, Saul. And he said, I think this was in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. He said, Did you know that rebellion, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft? Okay? Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and insubordination is like the sin of idolatry. You know, when I heard that, and I read that, I realized how serious uh, being unsubmissive is okay, to authorities. And so, sometimes I don't really actually speak against leaders, but in my heart, I had that attitude of rebelliousness, and I realized even that attitude was being equated to a major sin like witchcraft, idolatry. Okay, so how many of you here are uh, witches, <laughs> sorcerers, idolaters? Because you fail to submit to authority, to your bosses, to your parents, okay, to your leaders. Okay, so let's uh, look at, uh, so we talked about sin being uh, in terms of sinful acts, okay, not um, con conforming to the moral standards of God in terms of our actions, in terms of our attitudes. Now, here... We see that even in our nature, we fail to conform to the moral standards of God. So how about this? Even as an unbeliever, somebody who is not a Christian, okay, is sleeping, not doing anything, not thinking about anything, that person is said to be not in conformity to the moral standards of God. Let's look at uh, this passage. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it says here, We too all previously... All of us, previously, meaning formerly, uh, during the time that these people in Ephesus were not yet Christians, they lived among them in uh, fleshly desires, meaning attitudes, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, meaning actions, and we were by nature children under wrath. So, can you imagine a person who is merely sleeping, is incurring the wrath of God because of his sinful nature. Okay. So, so the, we have the definition of sin, meaning not conforming to the moral standards of God in terms of actions, attitudes, and nature. Okay. Now, let's, let's look at uh, where did this uh, concept, where did this sin come from? Where did sin come from? Uh, who, who invented, who created sin? Well, the first thing that we will learn from God's Word is, number one, sin did not come from God. Okay? Sin was not invented by God, not created by God. Sin is not from God. So, uh, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. It says here, He is the rock. His deeds are perfect, meaning blameless, so, you, you cannot ascribe to him being the author of sin because he is perfect, he's blameless. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just, meaning righteous, and upright he is. So, you cannot ascribe to God that being the author, being the one who started sin. So, sin did not come from God. Number two, sin also is not, did not come from, you know, having a uh, synch uh, synchronized meaning from the very beginning, we did not have dual forces existing side by side, meaning 
there was the force of, of good in the person of God, okay, existing, and at the same time, a force of evil coexisting with God. It's not, this is not founded, okay? We cannot uh, see any evidence of this. So there is no, sin did not emanate from the du du uh, duality of existence of uh, two forces, the force of good, force of evil. Uh, and now, which leaves us to the only option which we have, that God ordained. Okay, when I use the word ordained, this is uh, similar to the word allowed. Okay, he allowed, he allowed it to be part of his plan, um, just like what uh, Pastor Peter usually uses. There's the descriptive and the, the pre prescriptive, uh, you know, passages in the Bible. In this, in this case, sin was allowed by God. He did not del allow, uh, delight in it, but he allowed it through the voluntary choices of moral creatures. It was necessary for God to allow this because of the way that he created man. Okay, so what do I, what do I mean by that? In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So everything is in uh, aligned with the pur purpose of God, although he did not author it, but he allowed it for, and used it for a purpose. Because God, when God created us, he created us with a free will. Okay? And for us to be created of free will, it is necessary for us to be given a choice. For example, okay, you can drink anything, okay? You can drink anything, but, you know, all you see is a bottle of water, okay? Walang Coke, walang Pepsi, walang, walang orange, you know? You can drink anything, but, you know, you only have one choice. Uh, you know, you, you cannot exercise that uh, but you can only exercise the freedom of choice by having several choices. And it's because of the choice of man to not obey God, to choose what is not pleasing before God. Uh, that's the reason why he committed sin. Uh, Ravi Zacharias said okay, that there are four possibilities in relation to God and creation. So what are these four possibilities, according to Rabbi Zacharias? Number one, it's possible that God, you know, although he's all-powerful, he could have created nothing. He could have chosen not to create you or me. Okay? That's possible because uh, he's sovereign. And the other possibility is he could also have created a world where there is no concept of good and evil, meaning... If uh, I, I murder a person, you know, that's, I won't be arrested because uh, it's an amoral uh, world. So if somebody, uh, for example, steals your, your wife, you cannot be charged for the crime and you, you, that, that person is not doing anything bad because it's amoral. There's no concept of good or evil. Okay. What else? What are these? What's the third possibility? The third possibility is God creating a world where we only choose what is good. So that this now limits you as a robot. Okay? You can only choose what God wants you to choose. Okay? And if, even if you want to choose a Coke, uh, you know, God will uh, actually you know, uh, take over and make you choose. So you become a robot that way. You can only choose what is good. So you become a robot. Or the fourth possibility is God created the world that we know we now have where we can exercise free will and either be rewarded for our choices or suffer consequences for our choices. So ask yourself, what kind of world do you want to live in? Which creation do you want to live in? As a robot 
Or you were not created at all? Or nothing is bad, nothing is good? Okay? It's an amoral world. These are the four possibilities. And uh, to be able to demonstrate love, okay, means that you need to give people free will. And for people to be able to, uh, you know, just like what uh, Rabbi Zakaria said, in giving, uh, in uh, loving people, you have to give them choices. Okay, you have to give them the free will. If you love your, uh, for example, your girlfriend, ah, basta hindi ka pwedeng, hindi uh, ka pwedeng uh, mag, uh, what, uh, you know, you, don't, you cannot go out with your friends. So is that love? Okay. You cannot, you can, you can uh, st- uh, or you, a wife, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, you cannot go out and do shopping. So, you know, that's not love. In, in order for a person to exhibit love, that person needs to be given uh, a free choice. And in giving a person free choice, there's the possibility of choosing the wrong thing. And when the person chooses the wrong thing, for God, that is evil, that's sin. And when a person sins, there's the need for a savior. And when there's a need for a savior, there's hope for, there, there's hope for redemption. Okay, so that's how our system, our world was created. We were given choices so that the love of God can be demonstrated. And love can be demonstrated among men. Okay, so let's look at the nature of Adam's sin and how it affects us. First of all, what was the nature of Adam's sin? And maybe as we discuss this, we will see that you know, that very nature of Adam's sin actually is something that we regularly do, exercise, uh, day in and day out. God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave man choice. You know, there are many fruits, many trees in the Garden of Eden, and you may eat from the, the tree of, from anything, okay, from any of the trees. Except, you know, for man to be given, for God, uh, for, uh, you know, justice, uh, to, for God to give man free will, he needs, it requires for him to give them a choice, okay? To do good, to do evil. So when God gave, uh, when God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, it was necessary that there was a bad choice so that, you know, he can exercise his free will. And so when man was put in the garden, God said, Out of, from this tree alone, okay, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat. Okay, you must not eat. But what did Adam do? He ate. So the nature of his sin was disobedience. And then what else? God said, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But instead of believing God, man believed the antithesis of God, which is the serpent, the the, the evil, uh, uh, the hostile, the evil person or the evil character in the story, which is represented by the serpent, so he, instead of obeying his creator, his master, he chose to, or instead of believing his master, who was all good to him, he believed the antithesis of God, the serpent, who said, you will not die. So the nature of man's sin was a sin of unbelief, you know, uh, which actually brings me to... You know, thinking about, you have God's word, okay? Before, before, before we came to, to God, before we came to the Lord, before we became born again, we were influenced by so many teachings, right from our, you know, youth, 
we were taught by our lolo lola what to what to think what to believe our teachers in grade school our parents taught us okay and some you know well meaning as they are but some of them are ignorant about the things of god okay so we were some of you were taught to believe in superstitious beliefs some of you were uh, taught to to uh, to uh, to follow certain, you know, uh, religious practices which are not, uh, not actually from the Bible. So we get all of these uh, teachings from everyone. Then we were also influenced by maybe radio, television, as we listen to them, our teachers in grade school, in high school. We were taught all of these things, and we began to have our own thinking based on their teachings to us. And so when we now are confronted with God's word, there is a tension between what others teach you and what the word of God teaches you. For example, uh, when the Bible says, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So meaning, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the Bible says salvation is a gift from God, meaning it's not something that you earn. It's something that you merely receive because it's being offered to you. Okay? But instead of believing in God, we go back to those that taught us in the past or in our youth in, our, in, in education, in mass media, okay, that, you know, salvation is something that you earn. You have to work for it to be able to go to heaven. So you have this tension now about which one to believe, the Word of God or those things that are taught to us by our lolo, our teacher, our you know, religious leaders uh, we grew up with. But, you know, we, we, when, whenever we don't believe God, the, the Word of God, okay, we are actually sinning against God, about, against the moral standards of God. So I ask people, so when the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So meaning God gave his Son, okay, and his Son, and when God gave his Son, Jesus Christ, to the world, because he loved the world so much, uh, the world did not make him a king, okay, as he ought to be, as he deserved to be. But instead of um, making him king, his, their master, Jesus was crucified, he was scourged, he was, uh, you know, he was given a crown of thorns and, give, and made to suffer so many things. But all of these things were, you know, Jesus went through, why? For, you know, it's for a purpose. Jesus had to suffer those things, why? So that those who believe in him shall not perish, meaning not go to hell, but they will go to heaven, okay? They will have eternal life. So Jesus suffered, okay? God gave his own son to pay for our sins so that those who believe in him shall not perish, meaning shall not go to hell. They will not go to hell, but we'll have eternal life. There you go. Okay? As clear as daylight, God did everything. He gave his son. And so I ask people, if you were to rate yourself, okay, and maybe we can do this right now okay, to, for each and every one. I want you to grab a partner. Grab a partner, okay? Just a simple question. Okay. Okay. Just a partner, okay? If you find yourselves, uh, there are three of you, then you can, there can be three in a, in a group. Okay. Okay, this is the question, okay? Okay, this is the question. If you were to rate, okay? If you were to put a grade or a mark on your spiritual journey, on your spiritual life, and the grading system is between the numbers 1 and 10, if you tell me that you're a 10, you're telling me that if you were to die today, you are sure of going to heaven 100%. If you tell me that you're a one, you're telling me, or you're telling your seatmate, 
that if you were to die today, you're sure of going to hell. Where are you in terms of being sure about your eternal destiny? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. How many of you are one? How many of you are two? How many of you are three? What's your grade? So share to your seatmate. Okay. No explanation. No explanation needed. No explanation needed. Okay. Okay, done. Finish. Finish. Okay. Finish. No explanation needed. It's just a number. Whether one or two or three or four, five or six. Okay. Okay. Stop. 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 Okay. Stop. Stop. Okay. How many of you here? Okay. Let me ask you. Let me ask the partners. Okay. How many of you here? Your partner answered with a grade of five or four or three or two or one. How many of you? Your partner answered with a five or lower. So I see a few hands. Okay. Okay. How many of you, your partner answered with a six or seven? Your partner, hindi kayo. Your partner. Okay. Okay. A few hands also. How many of you, your partner answered with an eight or nine? Eight or nine. Okay. Eight or nine. Uh, Huwag na kayo mahiya. <laughs> okay. Okay. That table, wakang uh, pare-pareho kayo dyan ang sagot. <laughs> okay, how many of you, your partner answered with a 10? Okay. Sino sa inyo hindi sumagot? Okay. Let's go back to the Word of God, okay? The Word of God says, uh, can you recite John 3.16? Okay. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, the word but indicates that there's a contrast between eternal life and perish. So, if eternal life is going to heaven, perish is going to hell. Okay? And so, it says, it starts the... the, 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 the or, by the way, who among you knows... Who uttered those words in John 3.16? Who? Who, who, said, who said those words? For God so loved the world. Huh? How many says Jesus Christ? Okay, konti lang nakakalam. Okay. Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ said, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, shall not go to hell, but have eternal life. Okay. God loves you and me so much. Do you believe in that? Okay. So, that he gave his own... What, what, what did he do to, to prove that he loves you and me? He gave his only begotten son. Okay. And when he gave his only begotten son, he was made to suffer and he died. And while he was suffering, crown of thorns, you know, his back was, uh, you, know, of, you know, there were a lot of ribbons hanging out there of skin and flesh and bones because of the the effect of the scourging, and he was given the crown of thorns, and aside from that, you know, he, with his back, you know, on that, with that condition, his uh, head, with that, that uh, wearing that crown of thorns, he was made to carry this cross, okay, and put that on his back, carry that on his back, and you can imagine how painful that can be, and for that cross not to, you know, para hindi matumba, what he needs to do, he needed to do was to embrace, to hug that very tightly, so that it will not, you know, uh, it, will, it will not topple down. But what will that do to the to the crown of thorns on his head? Can you imagine how painful it was for Jesus? And when Jesus was there on the cross, tell me, where was God the Father? Was he absent? No, but. Because if there's a, a father who loves his son and he would witness that thing being done to his son, what could have he done? You know, he could have, you know, with his, all his powers, he could have saved his son. He could have asked his angel to rescue. He could have uh, ordered lightning bolts to strike all of those who, who uh, did those uh, dastardly acts of Jesus. He could have sent a powerful tsunami, wipe out all of those people, but he did not do that. Why? Because God loves you and me. Amen. Okay? Okay. So that, what's for, what for? So that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, 
but that we will go to heaven. We will have eternal life. Now, let me ask you, according to Jesus, what's the only thing that he is asking from you and from me? According to his words. What's the only condition for you and for me not to go to hell, but to go to heaven? Believe. Believe his words, okay? Now, uh, I'm sorry for those who said uh, they are 8 or 9 or 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But that tells me that you do not believe the words of Jesus. Because it's very clear, according to Jesus, believe in him. Okay? The Bible says, I give them eternal life. And, we, and if our reaction is, you know, it's very hard to believe, you know. But God says it. So, what's our choice? We need to believe. And the, the, the fact is, the problem is, many of us, were not reading our Bibles. So we do not know what God is communicating to us. We do not know His promises. And so we cannot live out His promises to us. So the lesson there is, we need to believe. That was the main, one of the main, uh, one, one of the uh, first uh, faults of Adam when he chose not to believe God. What else? The Lord God, uh, God said, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. He was dust. He was weak. But God created him, gave him life. But because, what, what did he choose to do? Because of the serpent who said, You'll be like God. So instead of being, you know, dependent on God, he wanted to, be independent of God. He wanted to go on his own, away from God. And again, that's a, a tendency or the sin that we also commit today. The tendency not to depend on God, but depend on others, depend on our wealth, on our abilities. And so, this is the nature of Adam's sin. Now, how does the sin of Adam affect us? Because of Adam's sin, we have inherited the guilt, okay, because of his sin. We are guilty because of Adam's sin. Where do we find this? It says in Romans 5.12, just, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. The fact that we die, we inherited this guilt because it says here, Sin entered the world through one man, okay? And because of that one sin, all of the people who lived after Adam died. Okay? You have here a record in, uh, I think, in uh, Genesis chapter 5, a list of those people who, who died one after the other. Okay? They lived for so long, and after a while, you know, after 900 years, after 700 years, after 600 years, they, they died. To be sure, sin was in the world be before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Imagine this. Uh, during the time of Adam, was there already you know, the Torah or the laws of God? Were the Ten Commandments already given to man? And so the Ten Commandments were, you know, uh, reflected the moral senses of God, but how is it that even the, the people who lived between Adam and Moses, even though, according to this, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, they did not break any command because there was no command at all. You know, uh, from the time of uh, after Adam and, after, and before Moses, there was... You know, it was the, the Ten Commandments or the laws of God were not yet in existence. It was not yet given. And yet, we see people dying after Adam up, up to the time of Moses. It shows here that we inherited the guilt of Adam even though we did not choose to disobey God. We did not sin the sin of Adam which was disobedience to God. So people from the time of Adam to Moses died, even if they did not disobey God. But we see here, consequently, just as one 
trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Just for, for just as though through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Okay? So this emphasizes the same point as 512. But some people will say, oh, you know, how unfair can this be? I did not commit the sin of you know, disobedience to God, and yet why, why impute or why charge, why penalize me for the sin that I did not commit? Okay? Uh, when it was actually Adam who, who actually committed the sin and the guilt was handed, passed on to me. So people will say this is unfair, but people who say this is unfair has also voluntarily committed many actual sins for which God holds them guilty. So people will say this is unfair, but God said in Romans 2, 6, or the Bible says, God will repay each person according to what they have done, meaning the basis of our judgment on the last day will be the deeds that we have done, the actual sins that we have done. Another reason is that for those who say that that's an, that's an unfair uh, setup, number two, if we think it's unfair to be represented by Adam, then we should also think it's unfair for us to be represented by Christ in the opposite manner. Christ did not sin, and yet he represented us, he suffered for us, and he paid the whole penalty for us so that we will be... Uh, represented in the opposite manner. It says in Romans 5.19, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So this balances the decision of Adam to disobey God. Jesus came and decided he will obey God and he will save people by assuming the penalty that rightly, uh, we rightly deserve for each and every one of us. So how does this uh, what's the other part about how does the sin of Adam affect us? It does not only cause us to inherit that guilt, but we also inherited that corruption. We have a sinful nature because of Adam's sin. Uh, it says in uh, all over the Bible, Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth. Even at birth, uh, King David was acknowledging, was admitting that at, even at that point, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. His nature was sinful. The wicked turned aside from birth, liars go astray as soon as they are born. This is all over the Bible. Okay, we find it also... Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline. So you don't need to teach a child to be naughty, to be, uh, to be foolish. So uh, instead, you need to teach a child to not to be foolish by spanking that person or that, that child so that the rod of discipline will drive it far away, so that he will learn the lesson about consequences of sinning, disobedience, and all of those things, or disrespect. Uh, also in Jeremiah chapter 79, the heart is, you know, like cancer. The heart is, uh, has stage four cancer. It's deceitful above all things and beyond cure. It's spread all over the heart. And so it's beyond cure. To those who are corrupted we do not, and do not believe, meaning those who are unbelievers, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. Okay. And the person without the spirit does not accept, even, you know, the unbeliever, it says here, cannot accept the word of God, the things from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. Okay, let's... Uh, so how does the sin of Adam affect us? So we have inherited this guilt. We are guilty because of Adam's sin. And proof of this is people die. 
Okay? Death is a result of the effect of sin in our lives. Okay? Uh, and then also uh, the effect of sin on us, the uh, effect of Adam's sin on us is we inherited this corruption. We have a sinful nature because of Adam's sin. So it's natural for us to, to not believe God. It's natural for us to disobey God. It's natural for people to uh, be de- independent of God. So this is now, when, when you talk about original sin, it's not the sin of Adam that stays with us and we need to uh, do something to remove that, that sin. But original sin is understood as the guilt and the tendency to sin with which we are born. It's original because it came from Adam. And it's original because it, uh, it started as we began our existence. Okay? Even as a child, you have that sinful tendency, that guilt in you. So, now let's move on to the good news. How does the sacrifice of Christ justify us? How does the sacrifice of Christ, if Adam's sin actually caused us to, to inherit his guilt and his sinful nature, how does now the sacrifice of Christ justify us? In Romans 5, 18, 19, and we have uh, seen this earlier, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people, meaning because of Adam's sin, everyone got, became condemned, so also one righteous act, by Christ resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the obedience of the, ma- the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Okay. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What's the meaning of atoning sacrifice? We'll, we'll look at, into that. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. First John chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice. Let me explain to you that expression, atoning sacrifice. Now let's look at the, the meaning of atoning sacrifice. It's also used in Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And then it says here in verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. So literally, this expression, sacrifice of atonement, the same expression we find in 1 John chapter 2, He's the atoning sacrifice. The literal uh, meaning of that is he is the cover of the ark. Okay? So, both Paul, Apostle Paul, and, Apostle, uh, and John said, Jesus was given as the sacrifice of atonement, or the cover of the ark. So, what does that mean? So, let's look into that. Uh, the Lord's, uh, so let, let's Go back to the Old Testament. The Lord said to Moses, okay, this was now the time when uh, God was giving instruction to Moses on the setting up of the sacrificial system. Okay, the, the tent, the Ark of the Covenant. And when the, when the furniture were already set up, the, the tabernacle was already set up. And uh, the, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron, who was the first high priest, okay, the first high priest uh, chosen to serve in the, the tabernacle during the time of Moses. Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses. He cannot just go there to the tabernacle, okay. Whenever he chooses, uh, whenever he chooses, behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover of the ark. You know, there, there you go again in front of the atonement cover on the ark. Or else he will die. So if, if Moses or if Aaron or anyone goes into that most holy place, 
and is exposed or comes near and sees that cover of the ark, it says here, he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. Meaning, uh, the atonement cover, that part of the Ark of the Covenant, is the place for God's judgment in the Old Testament. That is where God judges the sin of the Israelites in that uh, atonement cover. But, okay, on the Day of Atonement, the atonement cover, another word for this is the mercy seat. The atonement cover, okay, being the place for God's judgment becomes the mercy seat if, you know, according to this, he shall slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it, in this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites whenever their sins, whatever their sins have been. So, you know, God is saying that that cover of the ark is the judgment seat of Christ. But it becomes his mercy seat when, during the day of atonement, okay, I'll explain to you later atonement, okay, that term atonement, that judgment seat becomes now his mercy seat Every time during the Day of Atonement, blood is sprinkled okay, on that uh, cover of the ark, making it a mercy seat. That judgment seat now becomes a mercy seat in which God chooses to extend his mercy to the one who sprinkles blood or uh, on whose account that blood is sprinkled. Uh, why? For the life of a creature is in the blood. Okay? Uh, a, you have a living creature because there's blood flowing in its veins. The life of the creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves at, on the altar. If you remove that blood, okay? If you take away that blood from a person, that person loses his life. Okay? That person loses his life, so the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. What does that, this mean? You know that word atonement, that English word, is taken from the English word. It's not a Latin word, it did not come from uh, a Hebrew word. It's being at one. Okay, atonement be, means being at one. So how is this illustrated? During the time, whenever a person, a sinner, offers sacrifice for his sin, he brings a... Can I get a volunteer here? I think you've, you've seen this, but for many of you, maybe not yet. So uh, can I get a... Ito uh, lang, si, si Carlo... Carlo, Carlo, can, can, Carlo, can I? Uh, uh, Sama na rin si Tom. Tom, can, can you come for um, my prayer front and uh, just for us to be able to de demonstrate what this means? Sige. Here. For example, uh, a Jewish person or somebody from the Old Testament has realized that he has sinned, and according to the laws of Moses, Whenever a person sins, he needs to come to the, the tabernacle, to the, the priests, okay, and present a sacrifice. A sacrifice. So, who among you is the sinner? And who among you is the sacrifice? Ikaw uh, yung sacrifice? Sinner. Okay, si Tom yung sinner. And then, so Tom, as he approaches, for example, I'm the priest, he will bring with him to me a, uh, a sacrifice, a lamb or a goat. So come, you can come. So you bring your goat, okay? So, so Tom is now acknowledging his sinfulness, his guilt. And what he does is he brings a sacrifice, okay? And before I would 
you know, the priest would kill the sacrifice, the thing that uh, Tom would need to do is... For example, kasi wala na bang goat na nakatayo eh, no? So what uh, the, the sinner would do is he would place his hand on the head of the goat or the lamb. What? what what's the significance of this? this? This signifies that the sins of Tom are now transferred to the sacrifice. So they are now at one, okay? Atonement. This is now the atoning sacrifice because Tom chooses to acknowledge his sin and is bringing a substitute. So they are at one, but he's bringing the substitute so that the, his sinfulness, his guilt can be transferred here. So, so I would then, after transferring his sins, I would then kill this animal on his behalf. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Tom and uh, Carlos. Ganun yun, atonement, at one man. So you find this in the, in the book of Leviticus, always repeated, when you bring a sacrifice, you put your hand on the goat, and that goat will uh, take away your sins. Or, okay. So the mercy, at the mercy seat, God's wrath was appeased and His justice sat- satisfied. And we see here, now fast forward, you know, after, you know, to the New Testament, after Christ, we see here in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 14, the law, or that law, okay, the ceremonial law is only a shadow of the good thing that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all. Okay? And then, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the bull of goats and, and uh, bulls to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but the body you prepared for me. So Jesus Christ was given a human body. Okay? He was created with a human body because... Uh, his body was to be offered as a sacrifice. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Jesus said, here I am. I, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. And by that will, and by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when he offered himself okay, to be killed and his blood poured out, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So, through the one act of Jesus Christ, what's the effect now? It is once, but for all. Meaning, you don't have to do any more sacrifices. And Christ does not need to come down again to pay for your future sins because His one sacrifice, His one death, in which His blood was poured out, is sufficient once for all, for everyone, okay? And this is, gets repeated uh, in, in this whole passage. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious uh, 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 duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect uh, or complete, consummate, finish forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice he has been made, he has made perfect, he has com- made complete, consummate forever those who are being made holy. So they, are, they were made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. Let's, let's look at this one. Okay, be made perfect forever, made perfect so that by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you were made perfect. You who believe in him were made perfect forever. Now, what about those who are being made holy? Okay, perfect na tapos, being made pa parang hindi pa perfect. But what this means actually is that that expression, you were made perfect forever, you were made perfect positionally. 
meaning in the sight of God, you are perfect, you are perfectly acceptable, you can come before Him, okay? You are His child now, positionally, although experientially, we are still committing sin, you know? We, so we are being made holy experientially. So, which brings us to the three phases of salvation, okay? The first phase of salvation is justification. Justification is the time when you were saved from the penalty of sin. You will no longer be condemned. You will no longer be judged and uh, condemned or suffer to brought, uh, thrown out in hell because of your sin, because somebody else paid that penalty. And that's Jesus Christ. So you are now justified before God. But, so, for example, when I was 25 years old, okay, for example, this is when I was age one or zero, and then I reached age 25. Here, here, I was not born again. But here, when I was 25 years old, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and the Bible says, from this point on, on I am justified. Somebody paid for my sins, okay? So I'm perfect, acceptable before God, although I'm still committing sins here and there. But now, from this point on, this, this stage is now being called, now called the process of sanctification. And this is being saved from the power of sin. So as I walk as a born-again Christian, okay, and I'm growing, I'm now being saved from the power of sin. The power of sin slowly is losing its grip on me, okay? And the third phase of salvation is glorification, which is I will be saved from the presence of sin. When the time that comes that I die, there's no more sin in my life. I'm now saved from the, I will be saved from the presence. No more sin in my life. But right now, as I, as I still walk as I live as a Christian, there is still the presence of sin, but the power of sin is slowly losing its grip on me as I walk with the Lord. Okay, so finally, what is God's way for us to interact sin or counteract sin? What's God's way for us to counteract sin? In justification, you're saved from the penalty of sin. So you need to accept the gift of God, the gift of salvation as purchased by Jesus Christ so you'll be saved from the penalty of sin. Therefore, there's now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You will no longer be condemned. That word condemnation is the same word as judgment. You will not be, you'll no longer be judged to be uh, sent to hell because somebody else was judged for you. Okay? Saved from the penalty of sin. But, you know, what about how do you deal with sin in this stage, sanctification? You are being saved from the power of sin. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17, it says here, walk by the Spirit. And you know, that, that uh, statement is a command. Meaning, uh, what, what should be our response to God's command in the Bible? How should we respond to a command of God in the Bible? Like walk in the Spirit. Obey. Obey, okay. And this word also, walk, is in the present tense, okay? Meaning you have to keep on doing it. Walk by the Spirit. And you will not, the promise here is if you do that, you will not gratify, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Because we still have this uh, flesh, uh, carnal nature in us, even as a Christian, so, but for you not to gratify, not to carry out your desire, your sinful nature, you need to walk by the Spirit moment by moment. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict so that they, you are not to do whatever you want. Okay? And here we find, uh, if we live according to the flesh, uh, Galatians says there are two natures warring inside of us, the carnal nature and the spirit, spiritual nature. If you allow your carnal nature, which is your default system, okay, if you don't do anything, just walk, wake up tomorrow morning 
and just uh, go to the office or, you know, do your whatever, your plans for the day without coming before the Lord and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. You will default into your carnal nature and this will be the evidence or this will be the manifestations in your life, the acts of the flesh. Because you're walking in the flesh, uh, so this will be seen. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and uh, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, that word live is also in the present tense, meaning that if you continue to do it, you know, live like this, meaning that's your lifestyle. If you, uh, this, is, this is what characterizes your life, then it says here, if that's the kind of life that characterizes you, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what you need to do, if you are, you know, if you have the Spirit of God, you need to come before Him and walk. How do you walk? Step by step. So meaning each step, each decision, each action, magkocommute ka, magagrab ka, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Kakain ka, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. You're talking to someone, okay, you're discipling, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. You're making a decision, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. It's only by that uh, lifestyle that we will not carry out the desires of the flesh, but instead, okay, we will see these things being manifested in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So this is the process of sanctification. In order for you to be victorious, you need to walk by the Spirit. Okay? You're being saved from the power of sin. Because left on your own, if you don't have, if you don't use, if you don't utilize the Holy Spirit, the feeling of the Holy Spirit, you will always default into your carnal nature. So, I, I represent it this way. This is your usual way. If you walk uh, according to your usual way, the, deeds, the, the result will be the act of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. It's immorality, impurity, and so on and so forth. But if you make a concerted or a, 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 a uh, decision to walk by the Spirit moment by moment, you will be Spirit-filled, and the result will be the fruit of the Spirit. You know, you will see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, you know, being manifested in your life. You don't have to exert an effort because it will come out naturally as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, how should you walk? How should you live? You need to do it moment by moment in the power, in the feeling of the Holy Spirit.